On the 11th of November 1945, the economic authority of the US occupation zone gave permission to what was then Daimler Benz AG to produce platform vehicles, panel vans and ambulances on the basis of the 170V, also known as the W136 passenger car, which the company had originally launched in 1936. This was to be the beginning of the reconstruction of the company from the destruction of World War II. The license was extended to the production of passenger cars in the spring of 1946. In May 1946 a platform body vehicle was the first of 214 units to roll off the final assembly production line at the Sindelfingen plant that year. It was followed by the first delivery of a panel van in June, an ambulance in September and a police patrol car in October 1946. The number of units produced and gaps in production indicate that manufacturing conditions were far from normal. It was not until mid-1947 that the 170V four-door saloon followed the small commercial vehicles. In this video I'll show you some of the original press photographs which show the relaunch of this classic German brand and its complete recovery from the catastrophe of the Second World War. I'll jump about a little bit in time. Normally I like to start at the beginning and finish at the end. But for this video I'm going to have to go back to the beginning to explain parts of what is the end of which I'm going to tell you first of all. As soon as Mercedes had permission to resume production, the company sprang into action. A decision was taken to relocate the final assembly for passenger cars from Unterturkheim to Sindelfingen, something which had already been planned prior to the war. The reason for taking this step was that transporting bodies from Sindelfingen through the Neckar Valley to Unterturkheim was far more complicated than hauling drive units components from Unterturkheim to Sindelfingen. On the 22nd of February 1946, an M136 four-cylinder engine marked the first engine produced at the Unterturkheim plant after the Second World War. The 1.7 litre unit generated an output of 28 kW, that's 38 horsepower. The 170V saloon, produced in large numbers between 1935 and 1942, formed the tried and tested basis of the first post-war vehicles. The post-war ambulance showed the most similarities with the earlier model. The rear axle ratio remained unchanged, as did the wheel and tyre size. Both variants reached a top speed of 108 km an hour, and the permissible gross vehicle weight totaled around one and a half tons. The X-shaped oval tube frame was reinforced to increase the stability of the platform vehicles and panel vans, thus making it 40 kilograms heavier. The payload amounted to 750 kilos and the gross vehicle weight was around two tons. Engineers specified 4.25E by 16 as the wheel dimensions and matched these with 6.50 by 16 tyres. A shorter rear axle ratio was implemented in an effort to achieve a more ex acceptable driving performance. For this reason commercial vehicles reached a top speed of only 80 kilometres an hour. The vehicles came with very basic equipment. For instance, the vehicle's interior design was very functional and there were no chrome parts on the exterior, thus underlining the extent to which this production was focused on meeting basic transport and mobility requirements. The prevailing shortage of material brought about additional complications. Consequently, the vehicles were delivered without tyres, customers had to procure them for wherever they could find them, and this would probably be the black market.
Material shortages meant that there was a need to improvise when it came to producing the bodies of the 170V commercial vehicles. There was hardly any sheet metal available. As a result, the sparse cab, a separate assembly unit, consisted of a simple, though at least lightweight, wood fibre hardboard design which had already been used for a host of trucks during the war. Sliding windows were installed as side windows and doors were locked by means of simple rim locks. It was cold in these cabs, particularly in winter, not least due to the lack of insulation. However, occupants were at any rate shielded from the direct headwind. The instruments with black dials were initially identical to those in former Wehrmacht all-terrain vehicles. Depending on the purpose, either a platform, box or ambulance body joined up with the cab. Police patrol body vehicles were equipped with a tarp frame and two benches facing each other in the loading area. By the end of 1946, 183 small commercial vehicles in various variants and 31 ambulances were produced. Production of the four-door 170V saloon was launched in July 1947. The price of 6,200 Reichsmarks had been set by the government. However, these new vehicles were not available on the free market. During this period, a vehicle, be it a passenger car, bus, coach, van or truck, could only be obtained if the buyer could prove that it was a necessity. This added to the extreme popularity of the 170V and led to it being traded on the black market at a price that was several times its original price. The vehicle could change hands for 100,000 or even 120,000 Reichsmarks. This remained the case until the monetary reform of June 1948. From that point onwards, the vehicle was priced at 8,180 German marks. As of July 1948, the vehicle interior once again became ever so slightly more elegant when ivory coloured instruments with black numbering were integrated, as they had been before the war. In 1947, production totaled as many as 581 passenger cars and 464 vans. In 1948 this figure increased significantly to 4,500 passenger cars and 616 vans. Subsequently the increase gained even more pace. In 1949 Daimler-Benz produced 12,719 passenger cars and 382 vans. In September 1943, Daimler-Benz presented a wood gas generator for the 170V, weighing only 70 kilograms. Loaded with around 24 kilograms of charcoal, a vehicle equipped with such a unit could cover 100 to 130 kilometers. Fuel also remained scarce after the war, yet wood was available. For this reason, the wood gas system was once again produced from January 1946. Indeed, wood had been used as a fuel for vehicles in Germany as early as 1939, that is, before the beginning of the war. The Second World War began on the 1st of September 1939 with the Nazi assault on Poland. Immediately, the Wehrmacht became the German automobiles industry's biggest customer. In March 1940, Daimler-Benz converted to wartime production and produced monthly around 1,000 vehicles on the basis of the 170V passenger car, predominantly as all-terrain vehicles or vans. In November 1942, mass production of the 170V and 320, also known as the V142, passenger cars entirely ground to a halt. Production of the L1500A personnel carrier and the L1500S 1.5 ton truck, which was mainly used as a light fire service vehicle, continued. 
These vehicles can be seen in propaganda produ posters produced by the company in 1940. In March and April 1945, Allied troops liberated the Daimler-Benz plants. The Second World War ended on the 8th of May 1945. 70% of the Unterturkheim plant, 85% of the Sindelfingen plant, 80% of the Gaganel plant and around 20% of the industrial facilities at the Mannheim plant had been destroyed. The Unterturkheim plant was reopened on the 20th of May 1945. However, 1,240 workers and employees did not resume their former activities, but instead started with the reconstruction of buildings and facilities. During this time, commercial vehicles were initially more important than passenger cars. For this reason, production of the L701 three-ton truck resumed in Mannheim in June as part of a licensed reproduction of the Opel Blitz, which had been the case since 1944. In Gaganau, the production of the L4500, a four and a half ton vehicle, relaunched in August. By the end of 1945, a workforce of 12,850 was employed at all plants in West German zones. This figure increased to as many as 17,850 by the end of 1946. Vehicle production was still facing a number of stumbling blocks two years after passenger car production had been resumed in Germany. Dame LeBenz commented in detail on the political and economic framework conditions in a press release published on 20th of May 1948 in the run-up to the Hanover Export Fair, which was held for the second time that year. An excerpt read, It's a known fact that at last year's Export Fair there was a great success for Daimler Benz AG, considering that it was possible within a few days to land orders totaling around 1 million US dollars to supply goods to almost all European and several countries outside of Europe. However, in fact, it has only been possible to deliver a fraction of this order volume over the past few months, and there are many reasons for this. Firstly, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Finland, the Netherlands, Austria and France have issued import embargoes, leaving us with opportunities to supply only Switzerland, Belgium and Luxembourg in Europe. A whole range of other adverse conditions exacerbated this, as the press release went on to explain. The ability to export is impaired by the lack of numerous materials. These include, to name but a few, abrasive and polishing paste, waterproof abrasive paste, in short, things needed to produce high gloss polish. As little of these elements may influence German buyers, they are still crucial for the export market. Chairman of the Board of Management at Daimler-Benz, Dr. Wilhelm Haspel, addressed the press saying the following, The industry has largely been left to its own devices in terms of the procurement of wood, textiles, upholstery, materials, paint, etc. as the result of a completely inadequate assignment of these materials or a total lack thereof. In February 1936, the International Automotive and Motorcycle Exhibition in Berlin was dominated by the 50th Automotive Engineering Anniversary. Exhibits included the Mercedes-Benz 170V with the internal designation W136. The V indicated that the engine was installed at the front, Vorne is the German word for front, and correspondingly the 170H, also known as the W28, which was also available but much less successful featured a rear mounted engine, Hinton being the German word for rear. The X shaped oval tube frame forms the backbone of the new design. It is around 50 kilos lighter and also more rigid than the box type frame used up to that point, despite the longer wheelbase. At that time, the chassis was the cutting edge of technology. The front wheels were suspended individually on two transverse leaf spring packs. 
A swinging axle featuring coil springs was installed at the rear. The M136 engine with a displacement of 1697 cubic centimeters, upright valves and vertical carburetor generated 28 kW 38 horsepower. In an effort to achieve good levels of refinement, the unit was suspended as a floating assembly on rubber bearings. The M136 was considered simple and reliable. A host of body variants was available for ordering when the 170V was launched in March 1936. A saloon with two or four doors, cabriolet saloon, two door open top touring car, succeeded in 1938 by the four door version, cabriolet B and the two city roadster. In May 1936 the model range was supplemented by the sporty and elegant cabriolet A. Prices ranged from 3,750 Reichsmarks for the two-door saloon up to 5,980 Reichsmarks for the Cabriolet A. From the first pre-series unit in Ju July 1935 to November 1942, 91,048 Mercedes-Benz 170Vs were produced as saloons or open-top vehicles. This made this vehicle the company's most successful model by far up to that point. A 1939 brochure accurately summed up the circumstance. The extent to which this new vehicle type meets the requirements of the automotive market is evidenced by the fact that the Mercedes-Benz 170V has reached sales figures which had previously been unattainable for vehicles of this category. The 170V once again produced from 1946 was not just pivotal to the mobility of the first post-war years it also formed the starting point for the new Mercedes-Benz passenger car model developments after the war. In May 1949 Daimler-Benz presented the Mercedes-Benz 170D at the Hanover Export Fair, the brand's first post-war diesel-powered passenger car. It was supplemented by the 170S, a vehicle derived from the 170V but with larger dimensions and a more representative character. The continuously enhanced model range represented the backbone of the company's passenger car production until 1953. So, what did the press say? In the 16th issue in 1950 of the Neue Kraftfahrer Zeitung, the German motoring magazine, stated in terms of handling characteristics, output and equipment etc, the Mercedes-Benz 170V and D definitely form part of the pinnacle of the German passenger car. Automobile Review, a Swiss motoring magazine, noted in its 12th issue in 1950, the Mercedes-Benz Model 170V has long since passed the motoring equivalent of adolescence, but is it not a vehicle which in terms of its performance, modesty, economy, safety, durability and last but not least beauty can still stand comparison with the latest chrome plated creations of car fashion. So I hope you found that of interest. Thank you very much for listening. I have a lot more related to this subject on my YouTube sites. So I hope you will subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thank you again.